Uh, hello, uh, welcome everyone to this very special uh, lecture, uh, which is part of the QCD program that many of you are part of, but welcome to others who are also here for this special ICTS Distinguished Lecture. So the ICTS Distinguished Lectures are a series we've started to, uh, to uh, in which uh, eminent scientists uh, give a scientific colloquium level lecture. Uh, to a broader audience um, uh, on uh, some very exciting uh, topic in science. Uh, the first such lecture was delivered by Ashok Sen and we've had a very string of very distinguished people and in fact um, uh, last year I think uh, Rob's advisor and my advisor too, David Gross, gave one of the uh, distinguished lectures as well. Uh, so. Uh, so it's a particular pleasure to welcome Rob, and uh, we are academic siblings in some sense. Uh, uh, but I will actually hand it over now to Shantan to give you a more detailed, uh, uh, detailed in uh, introduction to the uh, uh, to the speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Gopakuma, for your kind words. And also, I would like to thank ICTSTAFR for uh, kindly uh, allowing us to have this. Uh, distinguished lecture as a part of our program. So it gives me a great privilege and honor to introduce Dr. Rob Pizarski. Uh, as you all know, um, uh, he is very well known in the scientific community for his very fundamental works, elucidating the properties of uh, QCD matter at finite temperature and densities. And uh, regarding his academic background, he did his uh, PhD, as you heard, from Princeton and his uh, with David Gross and then he was one of the last recipients of the prestigious Gibbs postdoctoral fellowship at Yale. After his brief stin, uh, stints at uh, uh, Cal uh, University of California at Santa Barbara and at Fermilab, he is in Brookhaven National Labor Laboratory as a senior scientist since 1989. And as you know, he is a fellow of the American Physical Society and also the associate editor of our Physical Review D. So most of us have heard from him when submitting for <laughs> reviews in our field of area. And just to give an outline of the wide range of works he has done in our finite temperature and density QCD. Um, so, um, uh, as you know, the understanding of finite temperature and density QCD is at the heart of, uh, uh, is at the core of our understanding of how the visible matter was formed uh, in the universe. And uh, Dr. Pizarski, along with Eric Bratton, had developed a very systematic uh, way of doing per, uh, perturbative calculations of thermodynamic and transport properties in QCD, um, known famously as the hard thermal loop perturbation theory. And among his other famous works are the effects of quantum anomalies on the phase transitions in QCD and the topological properties of QCD in high temperatures, which has inspired many recent works and still ongoing in different other, uh, using different other non-perturbative methods like lattice or other uh, QCD inspired methods. And people are working on these topics to understand further. And I would like to uh, invite Rob to give us uh, his, share his insights and perspectives on this. Uh, first of all, I'd uh, like to thank Rajesh Khan for the kind introduction and also for the invitation to speak here. I've uh, really enjoyed the meeting and I've got a lot out of talking to the other lecturers and in particular to postdocs and students here. I found it a very stimulating environment. And if I may say, since the director is here, a very comfortable environment. And it really, uh, really a very nice place to have a conference. So what I'd like to speak to you today is about the idea that in all fields that are, there are golden ages uh, because of serendipity, because of a concentration of talent, and because of technology. And when I, we're familiar with several in physics. One is the fact that you can have colliding black holes that by Einstein's theory of relativity gives us ripples in space-time and the gravitational waves. 
And this is the era of uh, astronomy with gravity waves, which I believe uh, Kip Thorne spoke here recently about, uh, of the uh, LIGO, the laser interferometry gravitational wave. This is a beautiful experiment with uh, two lasers about four kilometers long, and you're looking at the interference uh, between those two arms. I remember hearing once that uh, uh, Kip Thorne said that you could detect the quantum motion, the Zvita Bevegung, of a 10 kilogram ball. It's just an astonishing thing. And I believe there's a uh, new gravitational uh, observatory that's going to be built here in India. Anyway, the first event was in 2015. It was a collision between uh, two black holes of about uh, 40 and 30 solar masses. About two solar masses uh, in gravity waves were produced. It was about a million light years away. And uh, it involved an effort, it was relatively small, uh, about a thousand physicists and about a billion dollars to build and run. And it the, was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2017 to uh, uh, Rainer Weiss and Barry Barish, experimentalists, and uh, Kip Thorne. And since then, there's been a whole wealth of um, black hole mergers and now neutron star mergers that have been observed. And it's really uh, a very exciting new field. Another is the discovery of the Higgs boson. This is the discovery of the particle that gives most of us our mass. Um, this is a proton-proton collisions at the Large Hadron Collider. This involves, it's bigger, it involves about 10,000 physicists and about $10 billion to build and run. The physics turned on in 2010. Uh, they discovered the Higgs in 2012, and the Nobel Prize was awarded to Peter Higgs and Francois Englert. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Richard Brout had passed away before it could be awarded. And it tells us something fundamental about theories of matter. We know what the mass of the Higgs is. It's uh, just about 124 uh, GeV. But those of us in the field know that what everybody expected to happen has not happened. There's no signs of supersymmetry. Whether this is because at a higher scale or whether the fundamental physics uh, are different from what we expect is still not clear. And in that vein, it's really a shame. Uh, now it goes up to about a scale of about 13 eV. The superconducting supercollider would have gone to about three times higher energies. And perhaps we would have seen supersymmetry then. In any case, what I'm going to do is tell you something different, which is what the conference is about. Uh, we're all familiar with the fact as children that there are three states of matter, that there's gas, liquid, solid. But in fact, most of the universe is composed of a fourth state of matter, of a plasma. And this is simply uh, the fact that if you take an atom and you dump energy into it, either with an electric field or heat, that you can shake the uh, charges apart. So the electric charges of the electrons and the positive charges of the nuclei move independently. A uh, familiar example of this are the fluorescent bulbs uh, on the board here, where you pump in uh, an electric field. Another familiar example is a flame, which is about at 1,000 degrees Kelvin. The exterior of the sun, which is about 10,000, or the interior of the sun, which is at uh, 10 million. What I'm going to tell you today is a new type of plasma, the quark gluon plasma, that's just about at a trillion degrees. And this is made in the collisions of large nuclei at high energies. And so this is a cartoon of what I'm going to be telling you about today. I'll, I'll describe for you uh, everything here, but here, the, uh, this is a large nucleus. I'll describe the units, but this is about 15 across, and the energy is so high that it's, this is actually spherical in its rest frame, and it's shrunk down to a pancake that instead of 15 is about a quarter or a tenth in some units. So these pancakes uh, smash through each other, uh, they collide, and you have a collision in which you have thousands of particles coming out. And the challenge is to disentangle what's going on from these collisions. This involved about a thousand physicists. It cost about a billion dollars to run. And what's interesting, the reason why I mention this in each, it's about uniformly about a million dollars per experimentalist. Now, I'm a theorist, so I just want to be clear. I can be bought for a lot cheaper. 
But, but it's interesting, whenever you think of designing a new machine, for example, an uh, ILC or a new collider in China, it's going to cost you about a million dollars. Although perhaps in one it's different. Okay, I'm going to give you now a brief introduction to gauge theories. Uh, those of you who are in the field are familiar with this, but for those of you who are not, um, this involves the usual electromagnetism. We have electric charges, and they're just a number. What matters is the sign. Is it plus or minus? And then it's an integer. So, for example, uh, you have electrons which are negatively charged, protons which are positively charged, and at some distance r, they interact by the familiar Coulomb's law. It falls off like one over the distance. Uh, the overall sign is such that charges of opposite sign attract and charges of like sign repel. Uh, this is somewhat like, oh, it's somewhat like my love life, but I won't go into that now. Uh, the potential you can view as being uh, by the exchange of photons or light. Uh, now, an abstract description is that we view... Um, in uh, photons, we have a hidden phase. It's an angle that goes from 0 to 2 pi, and it's like the rotations on a circle. And one thing you can say, well, if it's like the rotations of a circle, the order in which I do things doesn't matter. If I rotate by one angle, theta 1, and then another, theta 2, it's going to be the same if I do it in the opposite order. This is what's known as an abelian group after the Norwegian mathematician Niels Abel, who lived in the beginning of the 1800s. And what is a rabbit that I'm pulling out of a hat is that this phase can be rotated independently at each point in space-time. And this is a very profound concept that uh, motivates uh, most of uh, modern high-energy and nuclear physics, and also much mathematics, known as an abelian gauge theory. In fact, the analogy of the Nobel Prize in mathematics is the Abel Prize, this was awarded recently to a mathematician, Karen Uhlenbeck. And you can see here, for those who are familiar, this is, in fact, the uh, field strength tensor in a non-abelian gauge theory. I, I have to say, too, that in the 1980s, when I was working on Chern-Simons theory, I, got up, I was confused as to a point of topology, and I called her up on the phone. And I, I, I can say that um, <clears throat> she does not suffer fools, or at least this physicist, gladly, uh, she answered my question in about a microsecond, and it was clear that there was uh, no point in continuing the discussion. But, uh, she's very famous for her work in uh, topology and the like. Uh, the modern view of light is the following. Uh, you have photons and charged particles, which can be electrons and the like. And what's interesting is you can write it down in one line. Now, I'm not going to explain everything of what this line is. Uh, there's a part that involves the photons. There's a part that involves the uh, charged particles. This is the theory of quantum electrodynamics, which was developed after World War II. It was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1965 to Richard Feynman, uh, Sanitary Tomonaga, and Julian Schwinger, who I'll show on the next page. And the way we view it now is, as I showed previously, charged particles emit photons, and the photons interact with charged particles. But the point is, because of this simple form of this Lagrangian, they don't interact with themselves. And let me say that, in some sense, all of the familiar physics that we're familiar with at a large scale of uh, condensed matter, of atomic physics, etc., all flows from the solutions of this one equation. <clears throat> this is a picture of the uh, Julian Schwinger, and uh, this is a picture from uh, Physics Today, and the quote was, this, a physicist who only needs pencil and paper to do physics, notice that he also needs coffee, of course. But the point is, he only needs pencil and paper because the relevant parameter that controls how strong these interactions is, is a very small number. It's about 1 over 137. So because this number, this coupling constant, is very small, it means you only need pencil and paper. And one thing he was particularly proud of is the following. This is, in fact, his tombstone. He passed away before his wife, but I assume he had given instructions to his wife. And all it says, it doesn't mention the Nobel Prize, nothing else, just mentions alpha over 2 pi. So why did he put this on his tombstone? Well... This was one of the first quantities to be computed in quantum electrodynamics. 
It's known as the anomalous magnetic moment. It's the coupling of a photon to the magnetic field. You don't really have to understand it in detail. I just want to make a general point. He first computed this at one loop order. So here you have a coupling between a photon, here's a charged particle, and it's a quantum process, so it can emit what we call a virtual photon. And when you do it properly, you get this number, alpha over 2 pi. And shortly after he computed it, it was verified experimentally. Today, you can push this calculation up to five loop order. And to show you what it's like, these are calculations at two loop. So you just start drawing all these lines in all possible ways. So you can imagine at five loop order, just to keep track of these diagrams, is uh, an amazingly um, impressive calculation. This is the result. The error is in the last two digits. And in particular, for the muon, which is analogy, it's kind of a heavy electron, the difference between experiment and what we know of as the standard model is one part in a billion. And in fact, this difference is now a very big deal in high-energy physics, and it's perhaps a hint of new physics of uh, what we believe is a unified theory involving supersymmetry. OK. Um, the modern theory of nuclei, well, what are nuclei composed of? Everything is composed of molecules. Molecules are composed of atoms. Atoms are composed of electrons whizzing around a nucleus, which is made of neutrons and protons. But we now know that neutrons and protons are made of the following particles. They involve what are known as the strong interaction. So we don't have a strong coupling. We're going to have a large coupling. And each baryon, which is one of these neutrons or protons, is composed of three quarks and some number of gluons. They carry a quantity known as color. This is uh, purely, uh, it's not a real kind of color that you can see. It's an analogy. But the basic point is that these uh, charges are no longer simply numbers, but complex three by three matrices. And for those of you who have ever, ever done matrix multiplication, you know if you take one charge U1 times U2, it's not the same if you do it in the opposite order. And this is what's known as a non-abelian theory. This theory, which is called quantum chromodynamics, in analogy to quantum electrodynamic, then involves what's known as an SU3 gauge symmetry. Now, clearly in this talk, I can't give you the full understanding of what it is, but you can, in fact, write it down in one line in direct analogy to quantum electrodynamics. We now have these uh, quark fields. Uh, the A mu is now a gluon, and we have some coupling constant. And if you write it down, things look kind of the same. In particular, the interaction between a quark and a gluon looks exactly like uh, that in quantum electrodynamics, except, except instead of a wavy line, I'm drawing a curly line. Uh, that means that things are actually more complicated. But in particular, I also have interaction between the gluons. And this I didn't have in an abelian gauge theory. And this is what makes non-abelian gauge theories uh, so very different, so challenging, and so interesting. In particular, you can look at loop effects. So in quantum electrodynamics, I can have a virtual photon turning into a fermion loop and going back again. And if you look at things, what this means is that the coupling is going to get smaller at large distances. And this is exactly what we expect from uh, common um, behavior with an electric charge. I can create electric charge someplace, but if I walk back far enough, I'm not going to feel the effects of that charge. In QCD, as I said, gluons will interact with quarks through a loop like this, but they also interact with one another. And because of this, it's highly non-trivial, but the coupling in QCD gets smaller at short distances. This is known as the property of asymptotic freedom, and uh, it's only true for these non-abelian gauge theories. You can calculate this. The coupling decreases logarithmically at short distances. And this is a plot. You don't have to know in detail what this is. Basically, Q here, it's a momentum scale, and so it's like an inverse distance. So as I go up in momentum, I'm going to shorter and shorter distances, and that certainly looks like this scale is uh, logarithmic. This looks like a 1 over a logarithm. And uh, it's well measured now experimentally 
in uh, cl various collider experiments. <clears throat> Now, this was awarded, the people who discovered this were uh, David Gross, David Politzer, and Frank Wilczek. And uh, what it shows is the theory is simple at short distances, and then you can then ask, well, wait a second. What happens at large distances, where the theory becomes complicated? Well, this was first uh, elucidated by Ken Wilson, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1982. He, in fact, did it for something completely different for the renormalization group. But a few months after the discovery of asymptotic freedom, he pointed out that, well, since it's complicated at large distances, you certainly can't compute with pencil and paper. So he said, well, let's follow our friends in condensed matter and put it on a lattice. And so what you do is like spin, you put the quarks, you treat them like spins and you put them on the edges of a lattice. And what's subtle is that to maintain this local gauge invariance, you have to put the gluons as links connecting these sites. Well, that's fine, you can do that, but what do you then do with the theory? Well, what's Beautiful is that because of the property of asymptotic freedom, you can take this lattice spacing to zero, and because the coupling gets weaker and weaker, you're guaranteed to obtain a unique answer. So one thing you could do is you can use a computer. And this is a slide that I stole from Marta Constantino. And she's, I told her I st stole this, and she wanted to give me lessons in how to say this in Greek. But yeah, you'll forgive me for not uh, butchering Greek. But the analogy is to Alexander the Great, who, when faced with the Gordian knot, said, you cut what you cannot untie. And so today, with modern computers, we simulate what you cannot solve. Now, the history of this is interesting. Wilson, in the 1970s, said there was absolutely no point in using the lattice, that you needed decades, and you needed much bigger computers. Uh, this is a picture of Michael Kreutz in 19... Well, it, it was some time after that. Uh, you might wonder, uh, this is in fact when he was at Club Med, so that in, explains the toga and the trident. He was, I believe, Poseidon. But those of you who know Mike know that um, he doesn't normally dress in a much more fancy manner than this anyway. <clears throat> in any case, um, in 1979, he was up for tenure at Brookhaven, and it was looking a little grim for him. And he had done simulations on a Z2 gauge theory, where on uh, the gauge fields are just plus or minus one, with uh, Lawrence Jacobs and Claudio Rebbi. And because of Wilson, they didn't want to do SU2, because it, Wilson said there's no point. And Mike, uh, being adventuresome, said, well, let me do it anyway. And what he showed is that you could obtain, even on very primitive results, this was the day of uh, Fortran on cards, you know, starting from column seven. Oh my God, it was... That you could obtain interesting results even with the very primitive computers at the time. And so this has spawned a golden age in Lattice QCD. He used that to show the following. If you're in quantum electrodynamics, as I said, if you pull two charges apart, the fluxes fall off with distance, like one over uh, the distance. This is the familiar Coulomb's law, so you can pull them apart. In QCD, this is not what happens. What um, you can show from a strong coupling exp expansion on the lattice, as Wilson first showed, or Mike showed uh, from numerical simulations, is that there's a term linear at large distances. Instead of the flux spreading out, they tend to form a flux tube. This is a picture of the flux tube that they form, and it gives rise to a linear potential where the coefficient is what's known as the string tension. What this means is that you can never pull out a single quark, as you can with a single charge. The only states that exist have zero net color, which is the property of confinement. So what you can then do, what people have then done, and many people here, Rajiv Gavai and many of uh, the Karma, uh, one of our hosts, is to uh, use big computers to compute uh, many quantities. Now, there's in fact a miracle that goes on. From the early 90s, it turns out that one can compute near the continuum limit in the theory without quarks. It didn't have to be this way. It's due to a relatively 
quick transition between strong and weak coupling, but it's, it's something that uh, is true. With quarks, with light quarks, uh, Ken Wilson was right. It's much harder. At present, we can calculate some of the simplest quantities uh, near the continuum limit, but um, there are many quantities that we cannot. And this is a plot simply the log of the computing power versus time. And uh, it, it's a difference between sustained power and peak power. But as we all know, it's been an exponential increase with time. OK. Well, before I go on, uh, I, I, I want to make a comment about the dimensions. The size of a proton is 10 to the minus 15 meters, which we call a Fermi. Uh, Enrico Fermi was a brilliant physicist. He made many fundamental contributions, Fer Fermi exclusion, Fermi statistics. However, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1938 for the phenomenon of artificial ra radioactivity. This was an experimental activity in which he took slow neutrons and bombarded, among, amongst other elements, uranium. And he only looked for decay products down to lead, and he claimed that there were two new elements produced, hesperium and osonium. Now, you've never heard of these because that's not, in fact, what happens. In fact, Ida Nodak, uh, when she heard of his experiments, said that he really should look for decays that are lighter than lead, and in fact, first proposed that there might be uh, the possibility of nuclear fission. Uh, she was a chemist, and uh, she and her husband are known for the discovery of several elements, and they were nominated for the Nobel Prize three times, uh, but uh, were never awarded it. And it's one of the things that I want to emphasize in my talk, and that's the idea of that everyone knows. So in this case, everyone knows Fermi is brilliant. That was true. And that fission was impossible, which was not true. And I, I mean, we're used to ourselves as thinking, oh, we're, of course, we're scientists, we're logical, and we always understand what's correct. But sociology plays a role. In particular, fission was discovered by Otto, Ta Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann. Uh, what they did is they did the same experiment at Fermi, but because of very careful and difficult chemistry, they discovered that it did decay to elements lighter than lead to uh, krypton and uh, barium, not krypton, uh, and barium. It, they found the barium. Uh, they published two papers in 1939, on January 6th and February 10th. Uh, they were in, uh, talk to uh, Lisa Meitner, who, uh, with her cousin Otto Frisch, published a paper one month later in which they uh, interpreted it as uh, nuclear fission, and with an enormous release of energy that, of course, we now know is responsible for nuclear weaponry and nuclear power. Um, Meitner had, by then, she was Jewish, and she had left uh, Germany for Sweden in 1938. And uh, unfortunately, Hahn was awarded the Nobel Prize alone in 1943. OK. well. Let me go on to describe the units in QCD. It's basically, it's small, it's quick, and it's hot. Well, as I said, it's small. It's 10 to the minus 15, um, I think that's centimeters. Anyway, uh, the time scales are quick. It's minus 10 to the minus 24 seconds. And the proton is very light. It's an infinitesimal fraction of a kilogram. And you might think, well, OK, so what could be interesting going on? But if you turn this mass, into Kelvin, it's about 5 trillion degrees. And that's why I promised you that I'd tell you something about, five, about a trillion degrees. Uh, we, we like to use units that are called MeV, millions of electron volts, and it's about 940. Uh, the theory is rather complicated. There's six kinds of quark flavors. Again, this is merely suggestive, up, down, strange, and then uh, three heavy ones. Uh, the fact that these are very light is a global symmetry which is known as a chiral symmetry. And this implies that the lightest particles um, are much lighter than the proton because of uh, nearly exact uh, chiral symmetry. But in fact, um, this won't play much of a role in what I discuss, and so I'll skip over it. Um, these densities are so large that if you took the entire Earth, you could pack it into a uh, soccer stadium which, since this is 
a wonderful institute of uh, learning. You don't have a soccer stadium near here, right? In American universities, there's always a football stadium nearby. In any case, um, you can also take the sun and it, you could compress it into a neutron star, which is a few kilometers across. Okay, so what is the phase transition to a quark-luon plasma? At low temperatures, we only have uh, these pions, uh, kaons, and uh, baryons. This is because of infrared slavery. They have a small pressure because there's only a few degrees of freedom. At high temperature, well, if we go to very high temperatures, the coupling constant goes like one over the logarithm by asymptotic freedom. So we must get an ideal quark-luon plasma at infinite temperatures. And so the pressure will be large, and we might expect to have a large increase in pressure in going from a confined phase to a quark-luon plasma. Now, in this, the field depends crucially upon results from the lattice. It really is the bedrock upon which the uh, field results. One of the results that we now have from uh, about five years ago is that the lattice can measure the pressure at non-zero temperature uh, with uh, reasonable accuracy. This band here refers to the uh, errors in going to the continuum limit. I'm plotting the pressure over t to the fourth because at very high temperatures, we only have massless degrees of freedom, and so we should approach the Stefan-Boltzmann limit. And what you see is that you have a rather large increase in pressure in a narrow uh, band of temperature. In fact, the uh, transition temperature is here. It's related to the properties of the uh, chiral of the theory. But I, I won't go into that here. The point is that we have a temperature of about 154 plus or minus 10 MeV, and this error is now significantly smaller. It's a few MeV. So it's really the lattice, as I said, upon which the intellectual structure of the theory rests. This is relevant to the early universe. This is a complicated uh, graph that I don't expect you to absorb. The basic point is that the transition to a uh, uh, quarks and gluons occurs about a microsecond after the Big Bang. And of course, much of what we're doing has uh, direct relevance for this uh, time in the, after the Big Bang. What I'm going to tell you about today is how we can find the quark-luon plasma in heavy ion collisions. Uh, Raju Venigopalan, who spoke last week, uh, used uh, a uh, picture like this I, I, I stole this from Miklos Julasi, and the idea is that, well, the quark-luon plasma is like other mythical creatures, such as the unicorn, and this is a tapestry from the Middle Ages. Uh, that means that experimentalists are hunting the quark-luon plasma, and if you look here, the only other creature are dogs, so this illustrates the well-known adage that all theorists are, um, oh, dogs. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so we're dogs, so what? Um, in fact, the use of non-abelian gauge theories rests upon results by Gerard Udhoft and his advisor Martinez Veltman. This is Udhoft, this is Veltman, who showed that they satisfy a constraint known as renormalizability. Now, I gave this uh, talk once at uh, NECAF. And uh, Veltman was sitting in the front row where you gentlemen are. And uh, he was being, I was terrified because he has a great, fierce reputation in the field. And I, I, I didn't know why he was there. And once he heard this, he loved the analogy. He was like, oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, theorists are always sniffing each other's behinds. Uh, the dogs are always making a mess that the experimentalists have to clean up, on and on. And what I didn't realize, he's making these completely inappropriate and rude comments. I can hear him fine, but nobody else in the room can hear what he's saying. And uh, so a friend of mine, Dan Bohr, was sitting next to the head of NECAF, who was a theorist, <coughs> and said that it set a new low in colloquia at NECAF, uh, a record which I hope has, I've maintained to this day. In any case, it also illustrates uh, something and that is, uh, before the experiments that I'll describe were built, 
that the uh, field was treated with a uh, great degree of skepticism. I remember hearing a talk by Bell Willis in 1980, who described uh, what was interesting about the collisions of uh, heavy ions at high energy, simply because you had, you'd have so many thousands of particles, it'd be a great challenge to disentangle what's going on. Uh, this is something that, in fact, has proved of great use, even in proton-proton collisions at the LHC. But I remember coming out, and uh, Tom Applequist, who I should say is a great theorist, who I worked with uh, very intensively and taught me uh, power counting and the like, said that, in fact, um, well, let's see. Uh, everyone knows that heavy ions are, well, for example, you can uh, collide calcium on calcium and espanol caca on caca, en français mer sur mer, uh, auf Deutsch, uh, Scheiße und Scheiße, and this is the analogy in Japanese. So everybody thought that this was going to, it had always been shit on shit, it would always be shit on shit. <clears throat> and it's turned out to be anything but. Okay, well, why do we want big collisions? Well, because we want thermal behavior. So the bigger the nuclei, the better. Uh, the radius goes like, the atomic number tells you how many nucleons there are. So it goes up from A equals 1 for protons to 200 for lead or gold. Uh, the size goes like the, since it's a sphere, like the third power. So it's about 7 Fermi for uh, gold or uh, lead. And that's why I said the diameter initially was 15. We have two thermodynamic parameters if we reach a thermal system. One is temperature, the other is chemical potential. It turns out that because of the sign problem, the lattice today can only do the case where you have no net baryon number. This is fortunate. So what could happen? Well, we have two big nuclei at very low energies. So there's going to be Coulomb repulsion. They don't even come, up, uh, come together. At higher energies, they'll form one big blob. But then at very high energies, they're going to go through one another, and you might uh, form a baryon-free regime. And for this, we need high energies. And so the question is, how high? This is due to an analysis done first by James Bjorkane in 1983, uh, a great hadronic phenomenologist who I think should, but unfortunately probably never will, uh, receive a Nobel. And what he pointed out is that if you go to higher and higher energies, you eventually get a plateau. So this is a variable eta. This is the num number of particles versus eta. This is a measure of the momentum along the beam. So if I'm sitting here at zero, if I'm at a collider with the particles are coming in equal and opposite directions, this is at 90 degrees. As you go down here, you're going down the beam. And this is going up. This is results from gold-gold collisions at uh, the relativistic heavy ion collider at Rick. But the point is, as you go up in energies, you see a plateau. And in this plateau, um, you have a small amount of net baryons. And so this was his suggestion, that you could look, uh, based upon an analysis from proton-proton collisions, for this plateau, and you would have a region that was uh, free of uh, net baryons. You would, however, get many particles uh, at least a uh, thousand in all. Uh, the uh, first place where you had a dedicated machine to study this is Brookhaven. Uh, the ions are produced at a Van de Graaff, which goes to an alternating gradient synchrotron, and then to a ring. And you might think, oh, this was, illustrates how uh, you know, physics pr uh, progresses rationally and in steps. In fact, it was nothing like that. The AGS was built in the 1960s and did a lot of uh, profound work on CP violation, uh, muons and the like. The tandem was built in the 70s and did work on heavy ions but wasn't connected to the AGS. This ring here was originally built for a proton-proton collider uh, termed Isabel. It was canceled in 19... Uh, 83, because they were going to build the superconducting super collider, which was itself canceled in 1993. Uh, at the time when it was canceled, Nick Samuels, who was head of uh, the lab of Brookhaven at the time, uh, because of talking to people like T.D. Lee, Larry McLaren, uh, Gordon Bame, at the like, within one week's time turned it 
from a high energy machine to a nuclear machine where you'd study the collisions of um, heavy ions. What was fortunate is that he lined the tunnel so that you didn't have to worry about it colliding, which they did not do uh, at the uh, SSC. The Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider was constructed between 91 and 2000, and it studies energies from 7 to about 200 GV. Remember, GV is the uh, mass of a proton, approximately. Um, this is a simulation of what the Large Hadron Collider is like. The energy here goes up to 3,000 GV. In this case, there is a rational progression from the proton synchrotron built in 1959 to a super uh, proton synchrotron in 74 to the Large Hadron Collider in 2008. This is a simulation. Uh, here, this is the uh, Higgs theory uh, illustrating what the um, collisions of heavy ions are like. It also illustrates that the Europeans are much more rational than the US scientific establishment. And what happens is you're going to see the two nuclei are going to collide, and you're going to have the production of a large number of uh, particles coming out. And the challenge is to disentangle what's happening from the thousands of particles that are being created. Uh, of course, I should say the colors are entirely false. They mainly uh, illustrate the um, energy deposition. OK. The, uh, there are two experiments at RIC, a uh, star and Phoenix. Uh, this is a picture of star. This is a Phoenix. Uh, they're relatively small. And what's interesting is the number of physicists working on the experiments is approximately equal to the particle multiplicity. So this is about 1,000. It's true. It, it, it is true. At the Large Hadron Collider, they're much bigger. Look, this is one person here. This is the CMS is the compact muon. Uh, this is the compact detector. Atlas is huge. Elise, which is a dedicated heavy ion, is huge. It involves tens of thousands of 10,000 physicists. OK. So why was the skepticism about the uh, nucleus-nucleus collisions? Well, everyone knows. And, and it's a reasonable idea that in high energy physics, understanding and simplicity comes from studying the collisions of a few particles. What was not under what was underappreciated is that in statistical mechanics, simplicity can come from complexity, from the production of many particles, and in looking at average quantities. So this is one plot. You might ask, well, you have this, is it thermal? Now, I should be clear, I'm not going to argue that you definitively produce a system in thermal equilibrium. I think I will prov provide evidence that you have a qualitatively new state of matter. Nevertheless, this is really kind of an astonishing figure. So what this is, is you can fit all the abundances of particles, pions, kaons, protons, going down to not only helium-4, but anti-helium-4, with a single fit that any undergraduate could do from the usual um, uh, Bose-Einstein uh, statistics. The point is that you have a single freeze-out temperature. And if you think about it theoretically, I mean, you have collisions, things are bouncing around, they form. Why should they all be characterized by one freeze-out temperature? And yet, you know, you have, what, nine orders of magnitude difference in abundances. It's really quite impressive. Now, it's not true for all particles. It's not true for uh, these very heavy particles, uh, charm and bottom. Uh, they're not produced statistically. But if nothing else, this is telling you that the working hypothesis of a thermal system is not a preposterous idea. So in the time remaining, I've spent a long time introducing you to the concepts of gauge theories, to the concepts of a quark law and plasma is to, I'll tell you about uh, two uh, phenomenon that I uh, think are um, established by the experiments. One is that of elliptic flow and the concept of the most perfect liquid on Earth. 
So this is a matter of geometry, because as I said, the nuclei are big. This is about 15 Fermi across. And so you can have the following, where they could overlap completely. This is known as a central collision. But just by geometry, this isn't going to happen most of the time. Most of the time, you're going to have a peripheral collision in which they only overlap in some kind of region that forms an almond. Experimentally, you can easily determine this because you can look at the number of participants. Uh, typically, you trigger on something bigger than 100. They can go down to now uh, tens. And the maximum will be 400 when they overlap completely. And you can then ask, well, how does this almond evolve? And what you start out with, you start out with a system, well, this is a long direction here in the y-axis. And this is a short region here in the x-axis. So you start with a region that has some spatial anisotropy. Now, if the particles didn't interact at all, they just fly apart, and that would be that. You wouldn't communicate this spatial anisotropy to a momentum anisotropy, because you can't, the, this is an incredibly small size. All you can observe is the momentum distribution of the particles. But if collective effects are present, you can look at the difference in the momentum squared in the y direction along the long direction and the short direction. Now, you might say, well, wait, I, I don't know what's long and short, but in fact, you have so many uh, hundreds, thousands of particles that you can distinguish the two directions. And the point is that if they interact strongly, this uh, anisotropy in coordinate space will be transferred to uh, momentum space. For this to happen, they have to interact. And what people use is uh, nearly ideal hydrodynamics, where the basic parameter is a ratio between the shear viscosity and the entropy. And the shear viscosity is simply the idea, for example, honey has a high sh shear viscosity, water has a small shear viscosity. It's how easy it is to transfer momentum from uh, one moving fluid, element of fluid, to another. Uh, this is a slide I stole from my colleague Bjorn Schenke, who uh, does these kind of hydrodynamic simulations. And the point is, you look at the angular distribution. This is now with respect to the transverse direction. And you have various moments with respect to the angles of two particles coming out. And you can uh, fit these uh, moments and then compare it to um, hydrodynamic simulations, and you can go up to the second moment, start with the second moment, V2, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and you find excellent fits to a nearly hydro, ideal hydrodynamics. This ratio of the shear viscosity to the entropy also seems to increase significantly between RIC energies and LHC energies. Now, you might think, wait, wait a second, this is at a much higher energy, so this should be very different. But in fact, remember, the energy goes like the temperature to the fourth. So a relatively large increase in temperature, can it's only like the fourth power. So it doesn't necessarily mean a large increase in temperature. But it certainly indicates that this nearly uh, ideal hydrodynamics is a good description. Uh, you can compare this. Uh, ratio of eta over s to other systems. This is a fit to heavy ions, which honestly is suggestive. But the point is that compared to other systems, such as water, nitrogen, helium, it's significantly smaller. Now, I, I, I should say that, in fact, the shear viscosity itself is huge. It's about uh, 10,000 times that of pitch tar. But the entropy is also big. And so you have to form a dimensionless quantity in order to make a meaningful comparison. And in fact, um, uh, Joanna Erdmenger uh, this afternoon has been telling us about um, where a bound on this quantity comes from. The shear viscosity uh, actually goes like one over the coupling constant. So the fact, if we think this is small, we must be in a region of small coupling. And Juan Maldacena, in uh, 1999, conjectured that there is a duality with the gauge theory with an infinite number of colors. And the most supersymmetry, this is a symmetry between quarks and gluons. And uh, what's known as string theory on uh, anti-de-sitter space. 
Now, I, I'm not going to tell you what this is. They're both conformal field theories that are the same at all distances. This, in fact, this is a paint, uh, diagram by the Dutch artist um, Escher of what anti desitter space would look like in two dimensions. But there's a correspondence between these uh, two theories, and uh, Damson, Staranets, and Kovtun sh uh, showed that uh, in this theory that 8 over s would be 1 over 4 pi, which is uh, the close to the results that we see from experiment. Now, this is a different theory, but it's a beautiful result. Anything you can calculate exactly, I think you should compute. I'm sure our the string theorists sitting here in the first row will agree with me. And uh, th th this is a picture of Juan. Uh, again, it's a self-portrait of uh, Escher, and I've superimposed uh, uh, his picture. Um, and, and, and this uh, work, which uh, Joanna has uh, talked about, is uh, just a wonderful example of approaching these theories from a very different perspective. Okay, well, as I said, um, high, nearly ideal hydrodynamics uh, has uh, proved uh, very successful. It doesn't work at lower energies so well. There you have to include a much stronger non-ideal effects. It's also sensitive to the initial conditions, which are known as the color glass condensate, which Edmund Dianku and Raju Venegopalan uh, talked about. There are, however, problems. It really works too well. It works up to momenta, which are about two jab, which is a tenth of a Fermi. It's working much better than we expected. It also works very well for both light and heavy quarks. And if you think about this, it, it, it's really rather surprising that heavy quarks, which, as I showed you, uh, don't seem to obey a statistical thermodynamic description in terms of abundances, why it should work for hydro. And lastly, and this is a very important question, which was uh, uh, discussed uh, by Zoran Schlickling in the lectures uh, this morning and earlier, that the time scales that you have for thermalization have to be very short. Not a Fermi over C, which is the natural scale, but a quarter of a Fermi over C. And so things are working. They're working in terms of hydrodynamics, but we have to turn it on much sooner than we would have expected. Okay. The other thing that I'd like to tell you about next in the time remaining is something which Edmund Dianku uh, talked about this morning again, and that's jet quenching, that the quark gluon plasma eats jets. Now, jets are the idea that, as I said, um, QCD is asymptotically free. This means that if you have, go to very short distances, or conversely, a very fast particle, that it'll come out in a collimated spray of particles. This is uh, figures of jets at the Large Electron-Positron Collider. This is basically um, E plus E minus going to a quark-antiquark -quark pair. This is something like E plus E, uh, e minus going to a quark-antiquark -quark pair plus a gluon. So in ordinary collisions involving uh, hadrons, jets are ubiquitous at high energies. It's just the idea that you have this leading hard particle plus a soft spray. If you were to um, <coughs> have this in a quark-luon plasma, that because these theories are viscous, you're moving through stuff, um, that it will affect the propagation of this hard particle. And if you go through a lot of this stuff, it'll just turn into a soft uh, mush. It's like trying to run through, as I said, it's like pitch tar. Well, imagine running through pitch tar. Even if you start running quickly, you're going to slow down uh, pretty rapidly. Um, this is a picture of uh, two jets at the Large Hadron Collider in a nucleus nucleus by energy momentum conservation, if you get one jet in one direction, the energy has to be compensated in the other. But what you find is this is one jet at about 200 GV, so a very energetic particle. And in the backward direction, you only see 70. So there's very clearly this kind of jet quenching going on 
the, here, the, this is along the beam, and this is perpendicular to it. Uh, this phenomenon was first seen at the relativistic heavy ion collider, where you uh, measured a quantity termed RAA, which is the number of particles in nucleus nucleus, versus that in proton proton collisions at the same transverse momentum. This is the momentum perpendicular to the beam. There's an important check if you're to measure that for photons, since photons don't feel QCD, uh, this ratio should be near one, which is what you see. But once you go up to about a couple of times the mass of the proton, this ratio is uh, very flat and about uh, 0.2. So there's clearly this kind of jet quenching going on. Um, in fact, this being flat, uh, gave rise to the speculation that you really are in a strong coupling regime, as in this anti dissider and formal field theory techniques, and that when the LHC turned on, this would remain flat. This did not happen. When the Large Hadron Collider turned on, you saw a uh, much larger uh, uh, ratio of RAA. Uh, so this is. Um, this is the most central collisions. This is more peripheral, peripheral. This is most peripheral. What's surprising is that, OK, this is now instead of 0.2, it's about a half. But look, this is going up to transverse momenta that are huge, hundreds of GeV, which, again, is you would have expected it to go up to one rather more quickly, although perhaps Edmund will correct me and that this is perfectly obvious. But it also gives rise to what Edmund discussed earlier. This is a regime where we can now use perturbative QCD to analyze jet quenching. And it's a beautiful um, confluence of experiment and theory. Um, there is uh, still many open uh, questions about jet quenching. Uh, quarks and gluons have different color charge. And so you would expect you could distinguish between the uh, quenching of quark jets and gluon jets. Uh, this is not possible at the present time. Uh, more to the point, if you consider the radiation of a light quark versus that of a heavy quark, well, here the color charge is the same. But the scattering of massless gluons for uh, heavy quarks is much less than that for light quarks. And yet the... Uh, Quenching the RAA for heavy quarks such as charm and bottom is approximately the same. And, and this is something that is really very uh, surprising. Besides the program at the Large Hadron Collider, there's also an upgrade of the Phoenix detector at Brookhaven, which from 22 to 24 will measure uh, this kind of jet quenching up to much higher transverse momenta, up to about 40 GeV. Okay. Uh, I'm going to finish a little early. I, I have a last section that I told you what really was important uh, previously is moving up in energy to a baryon-free regime. Really, the outstanding, for me, the outstanding uh, questions in the field are now moving back down in energy. Um, as I said, we didn't want to study systems at low energies because then we have to deal with uh, systems at non-zero uh, baryon number. Uh, this is important for the following reason. The usual path integral is based upon the Lagrangian, which we can simulate with standard Monte Carlo. Standard Monte Carlo merely means you have a probability that's a real number. I can flip a coin, and you can tell is it more probable or less probable. It's not obvious, but for three or more colors, at non-zero chemical potential, the quark determinant is complex. This means the probabilities are complex. In the end, everything comes out to be real, but we can't flip a coin if the probability is a complex number. Um, you can use a Hamiltonian formulation. This is the usual partition function. It's a sum over states weighted by a Boltzmann factor plus the chemical potential times the number density. You can't calculate this in Euclidean space-time, but you can calculate it in principle using quantum uh, computers. And uh, one thing I wish to claim, and I honestly believe this, is uh, w one of the coming golden ages is derived the property, uh, properties of nuclear matter from first principles, that is from QCD uh, using quantum, well, 
as one of the great problems of the 21st century. Why is this a great problem? Well, you're going to have to solve the sign problem. You're going to have to use uh, quantum computers. This is something that's probably uh, uh, that Professor Patel here works upon um, is decades away, but for any bright uh, girl or boy in the audience, uh, you want tenure, you want a, a fortune, this is how you do it. Okay. Uh, it, let me uh, skip ahead to allow time for questions. Uh, there are experiments that are going on both at Brookhaven and at other accelerators that will measure um, nuclear collisions at lower energies. Uh, there's the beam energy scan at RIC that will go on from 2020 to 22. There are uh, colliders in Russia called Nika in Germany, FAIR maybe in Japan. It will have direct implications for the equation of state of neutron or quark stars, which will be measurable in gravitational wave observatories and X-ray satellites. So uh, to quote Gertrude Stein, who in 1890 said about Oakland, California, there's no there there. At low energies, I believe there's a there. I flipped through uh, some very exciting experimental evidence. It will uh, surely uh, be a problem that will occupy us for some time. But um, let me quickly just mention there are many other things I didn't cover. The problem with this field is there's this wealth of experimental data that's precise to a few percent, and the theory is trying to catch up. One is the chiral magnetic effect. Uh, this is basically uh, macroscopic uh, implications of uh, the quantum anomaly in heavy ion collisions. Uh, there's a experimental test of this that was run last year at uh, Brookhaven. The other that I wish to mention is that one thing that LHC has measured is proton nucleus and proton-proton collisions at very high multiplicity. So usually there are uh, only five particles per unit rapidity, but in about one in a million events, they have 50 or 100 particles per unit rapidity. So you have one in a million events in, say, proton nucleus, that looks like your average nucleus-nucleus collision. And this really looks like a little bit of the quark on plasma, at least fits with hydrodynamics, are very successful. They're competing explanations with the color glass. This is something, there's a special session in the conference tomorrow. But let me conclude by saying that um, here I've uh, stolen the great wave of of Kanagawa, Kanagawa by the Japanese artist Hosukai. Uh, this is what it's like being in the field. There's this tsunami of results from experiment, results which are valid to like a percent. And there's a few of us in theory who are like just being totally blown away by this. We're lucky if we get things to 50 percent, let alone better. But it's a very exciting field. There's many results that are coming out. And uh, with that, I thank you. Uh, before we move to the questions, uh, we just have a small little ceremony where we would like to show our appreciation to Rob. And I enjoyed your lecture very much. Uh, so I'll request Professor Spenta Wadia to hand over a memento on behalf of ICTS to, uh, uh, to Rob uh, for that wonderful lecture. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Rob, for this exciting talk. And over to you for questions. How would you uh, set up a QCD or a calculation on a quantum computer? It's an excellent question, which I'm supposed to answer next week. And I have, I honestly, uh, don't know. I, I think if you, I, uh, Professor Patel was just explaining it to me, that in a spin system, you need one qubit per spin. If you count the number of degrees of freedom, uh, at present they have computers with, say, Google has at best 50 qubits. Yes. You'll need thousands, tens of thousands with error correction. It will be years in the future. However, 
it should be a soluble problem. But in principle, using, uh, for example, as he was, Professor Patel was describing to me, quantum link models and the like, uh, at least in principle, you can solve the sign problem. The other thing that quantum computers can do is look at evolution in real time. Yes, yes. And, 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 and that's really very exciting. For example, I, I didn't mention we, for hydrodynamics, we need transport coefficients. If you only have simulations in Euclidean space time, it's very hard to get that. In real time, at least in principle, you could extract it. So you would use the Hamiltonian formulation of lattice gaze theories, actually. Other questions? One more from here. Uh, uh, so, is the data at a stage where is the accuracy? The data is at a stage where you can see deviations from uh, the first order hydrodynamics to, I mean, the from higher order terms in the hydrodynamics expansion, higher derivative terms. Uh, oh, you mean uh, corrections? Yeah. Uh, yeah, particularly when you go to above uh, two GV. And in, in particular, I didn't. The fits are telling you interesting things that to get a correct description out to such high momenta, you have to add bulk viscosity as well as shear viscosity. And we really have no idea. Uh, they postulate in a conformally invariant theory, the bulk viscosity vanishes, but near the transition, it's clearly not conformally invariant. But we don't have a very good guess for what that would be like. That's in fact what my research is now occupied with. I'd like to calculate a ratio of the bulk to shear viscosity uh, based upon models um, using results from equilibrium thermodynamics and extrapolated uh, by effective theories to uh, real time. Chemical potential ah. region, because you skipped over. Uh, the, uh, Current the interest in a um, going down to lower energies is to uh, find. I think I have a plot here. More. Hey. Okay. Hey. Okay, stop. Um, at zero mu, uh, this is uh, known from the lattice to be a crossover. There's no true phase transition. It was suggested first by uh, Asakawa and then by uh, Rajakobo, uh, Stefanov, and Churyak that as you go out in mu, basically the effects of fermions tend to change the sign of a quartic coupling, and this could become first order. You would then, in QCD, have a true critical endpoint. This would be very interesting. Uh, you could look for signals by increased fluctuations. Uh, with my collaborators, um, uh, Vladimir Skokov and Alexei Tsvelik, we've suggested an alternate uh, possibility where you have a region with spatially inhomogeneous phases, like a um, well, we term it a chiral spiral. And in that case, you wouldn't have a second order transition. You'd simply have an unbroken line of first order transitions. However, the fluctuations would still get big. They wouldn't diverge in infinite volume, but they would become big. Um, and uh, I, I didn't have time to describe it, but there's very interesting uh, results from the STAR experiment at Brookhaven that seems to indicate as you go down in energy to about 10 GV, that there's a huge increase in fluctuations. And this is one of the things that the beam energy scan two and uh, other low energy experiments want to measure. So the idea is you look at fluctuations, but uh, you know these exp collisions last for a short period of time. Extracting fluctuations is a challenging thing. Uh, this is fluctuations in that proton number, so it's easier to extract than uh, other measures of fluctuations. Let me, if I can ask a last question. So, uh, are there t 
terrestrial ways of probing the non-zero chemical potential in any, non, any uh, well, a good region? You know, no, there's lot, it, 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 it's a standard yeah. problem in condensed matter. No, no, but in the QC, what I meant was in the QCD phase diagram, can we uh, not through... Uh, uh, AI collision? Yeah, through... Uh, through okay, will we be probing it in any reliable way or learn? Well, look, really, from first principles, we'd like to use QCD to compute nuclear matter. We should get yes. the shell model out. Yes, right? uh, uh, yeah. But I mean, all, all this physics that none of us know, right? We've all... We either forgot or we never knew it. I mean, it should be derivable. Yes. Uh, no, I agree. But uh, that phase diagram that you showed, uh, how much of it can be probed? The the finite the the finite t oh, finite oh, oh, new oh, phase. Uh, okay. No. 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 I see what. Yeah. It's hard going down very low in temperature. Is that your question? Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Look, in collisions, we're going to be up here some point, but yeah, it's it's going to be very hard to go very low in temperature, and and at high mu. Yes. Oh, I see. That was your question. No, no that's that's very hard. But never underestimate the cleverness of experimentalists. I, I mean, for example, one way they've discovered at Rick to go down to very low energies, instead of using it as a collider, they just take the beam and they hit a beam wall. And so it's a fixed target experiment. And then they just look at stuff going down the beam. Uh, and then they can go down to like 3 GeV. It's, it, I, I hope I've communicated it's a real triumph for experiment. And to be perfectly blunt, I think it's well-deserving of the highest prize in physics. I don't think it will reach that because of the rule of three and the competition between Brookhaven and uh, CERN, but I, I, I think it is deserving of that. And it, let me conclude by saying, for those of us who've been in the field since before Rick turned on, none of us expected it would be such a spectacular success. No, well, okay, there's one person, no one in their right mind who, <laughs> The one person I won't say. He was head of a major experiment. Uh, never let me not say. But, 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 but it's something, as I said, where it's unfortunate because, you know, theory's trying to keep up, and it, it, it's just we're not there.